If you think about what a video game actually is, it's essentially a tiny virtual universe. There are things in the universe, characters, objects, and how they interact. And then there's the players who interact with the universe by the means of some input device, touching the screen, pressing a button, or clicking the mouse. So if video games are like universes, to pull off a multiplayer video game, you need some way to construct parallel universes. We want both players to see the same world at the same time. But how do you create parallel universes? There's basically two ways to do this. You can either sync the input or you can sync the world. Let me explain. To keep things simple, let's consider a classic game, chess. In the real world, chess is effortlessly multiplayer. There's two people, one board, and both people touch it. But let's imagine there's a global pandemic and you're practicing social distancing, so you and your friend want to play chess on your computers over the internet. How would you do that? And okay, let's pretend there aren't existing online chess implementations. Let's assume you wanted to do it the good old fashioned way. You and your friend each have your own physical chess board and you're both on a Zoom call. In other words, two parallel universes connected via the internet. The challenge is making sure that both chess boards match at all times so that you and your friend are playing the same game even though you're on two different boards. There are lots of ways to solve this problem, but they all boil down to two strategies. Either you can sync the input or you can sync the world. Let's see how these approaches could work for our game of chess. In chess, every position on the board is assigned a letter and a number, so each square can be uniquely identified. In the sync the input strategy, each player announces the move they make. For example, if you want to move your pawn, you could announce to your friend over Zoom, I move from position D2 to position D4. Your friend then says, okay, sure. And then you both move the pawn. Then it's your friend's turn and they announce their move to you and so on. During the course of the game, the board will change a lot. But because you've been taking turns announcing your moves, you're both able to follow the same steps and should end up with two identical chess boards. But there's another way to solve this problem. Instead of announcing what moves you make, you could describe what your chessboard looks like after each turn. For example, you could read out, there's a white rook at square A1, a pawn at square A2, and so on, for each of the 64 squares on the chessboard. With this approach, you don't actually need to say which move you made, but the other player can infer it by noticing the difference between the state of their board just before and just after your turn. Just about every multiplayer video game you've ever played has used one of these two approaches. Of course, video games are much more complicated than chess. They can involve dozens or even hundreds of players who could be thousands of miles apart in real life. And instead of a two-dimensional grid of 16 distinct pieces, Video games can use 3D graphics and often involve hundreds of different types of objects, which can be anywhere across a large virtual game world. Describing the moves or game worlds of some video games might take pages and pages of text if you were to do it by hand. Of course, we don't have to do that because we have the internet and computers. So video games use variations of the sync the input and sync the world strategies to take advantage of the awesome capabilities of computers and the internet. Early video games, such as the first-person shooter Quake and the real-time strategy game Age of Empires, usually only let 5 to 10 people play the game at once. So to synchronize the games, they connected each player to every other player, also called peer-to-peer. -peer. Most video games today don't do this, though. Instead, they use an extra computer, a server, to handle communication between the different players. Having a dedicated server means that each player only needs to connect directly to one other computer, the server, instead of every other player, which makes it possible for more players to play together at once. Having a server is also helpful because it can stay online even when players leave the game. The game server can also act as a referee, making sure that players can't cheat by making up moves that didn't really happen. Multiplayer systems also need to deal with slow and unreliable internet connections like playing over Wi-Fi in that one corner of your room that has really bad signal. This is a big topic that I might cover in a future video. But back to the most important question. How do games decide whether to sync the input or sync the world? 
The answer is, it depends on the game. Syncing the input is a good approach for games that have complex worlds and where player inputs can be divided into discrete operations. This makes them a great fit for strategy games, whose maps can have hundreds of units with many attributes. That's why popular strategy games like StarCraft and Civilization typically use the sync the inputs approach. For these games, it's much more efficient to say, player one pressed spacebar, rather than describing the state of the game world, which could involve specifying the positions and hit points of hundreds of units. Syncing the world, on the other hand, is a good fit for games where the world doesn't change very much during the course of the game, but where player input changes very rapidly. That's why large-scale, multiplayer, first-person shooters like Call of Duty and Fortnite use this approach. Although these games involve big maps with lots of objects, most of those objects don't change while playing, like buildings, decorative objects, and terrain. Usually the main things that are changing in these games are the players themselves, who are moving continuously throughout the world. For example, a game like Call of Duty might send a message to the server like, Player 1 is at coordinates 430, negative 60, 1082, and is crouching. The server will then forward that message along to the other players, who then update their maps to move Player 1 to that position and show them crouching. These kinds of games can often use other techniques as well, such as interpolation and extrapolation, which approximate or predict where players are moving to make motion appear smooth and continuous even though what's actually being synchronized are snapshots of the positions of the players in the world. Sometimes these predictions are wrong, and if a new snapshot comes in that says a player is in a different place than was predicted, the game will have to correct it. This can result in a distortion sometimes called rubber banding, which is likely familiar to anyone who's played a lot of first-person shooter games. Okay, we've covered a lot of material in this video, so I think I'll end it here. In the next video, we'll talk about which approach I chose for my game, and I'll share some of the lessons I've learned in the process. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.